eyes and imagine for just a minute that you're visiting a museum. What does it sound like? If the word that comes to mind is quiet, you're not alone. A lot of people think of museums as places for solitary experiences. But at our museum in Santa Cruz, we're trying to disrupt that stereotype and to expand the way people think about museums, to think of them not just as places where they can have their own individual experiences, but where they can have intimate moments with people they love, where they can come together with strangers around games that invite them to connect with the objects on display, where they can share their creative skills with each other, where they can share a beer. And for us, all of this work drives towards one goal, which is trans to transform our museum from a cold, quiet place to a thriving central gathering place for our community. I know a lot of people in this room care about creating community spaces, and that's what we've been doing for the last two years in Santa Cruz, and it has absolutely changed the way our museum is seen in our community, who comes, and what they do while they're there. And what I want to talk with you about today is how this happens and some of the observations we've learned in trying to do it. And if you ask me, what is the single marker that makes a community gathering place, I would say it is this. It is strangers talking to each other. There are lots of places in this world where we can be social with people we already know. But if you want to create a civic space, if you want a gathering space, it has to be a place where people come to interact with people they don't know. And in my case, what I'm particularly driven by is creating places where we interact with people across differences, people who don't look like us, who don't come from the same backgrounds, who have different ideas. And to do that, there's that fundamental focus. How do you get strangers talking to each other? This is the question that has driven my career as an exhibit designer and now as a museum director. And I want to share with you just three of the things I've learned about designing for strangers talking together. But before I do that, I have a confession to make. My interest in this is not strictly professional. Um, I have an embarrassing fact about myself, which is that I am afraid to talk to strangers. Um, I don't have the cocktail party gene, and my whole life I have watched other people at parties, at conferences, and thought, how do they do it? How are they talking to strangers? How could I do it? And now, as a designer, how can I design opportunities for people to do it in the space where I work? So the first thing I've learned about this is this. If you want to create a great gathering space, don't worry about how great your space is. Don't worry about the furniture or the lighting or what it looks like. Worry and focus on the objects that are going to become the things that people talk about. I like to call these social objects, objects that are locuses of conversation between people. They can be physical objects, they can be concepts, but they are objects that bring people together. And let me give you a very simple example. How many people here own a dog? OK, great. So you've all had this experience, right? You're in the park, and somebody comes up to talk to you about the dog. And they are not so much talking to you. They're sort of talking through the dog to you. The dog has become this social object that mediates a conversation that otherwise could not have happened. You could design the fanciest park in the world with the best benches, and it would still be creepy to talk to strangers. But you can walk your dog across a barren parking lot, and somebody will come up and talk to you. That is the power of a social object. And so I have a dog. I realized these benefits. And I started to wonder, what if we could do this in museums? How could we make museum objects more like dogs? How could we make a painting not something you want to look at quietly, but something you want to talk about with other people? A lot of museum objects, let's be honest, are not as social inherently as dogs. And so a lot of the design work that I do is about activating museum objects to make them these kinds of social objects. There are many different ways to do this. At our museum, we invite people to write poems about famous figures from history in our history gallery. We invite them to come together and make collaborative artworks based on the objects on display. We even let them vote on which objects in our collection we should keep and which ones we should get rid of. This kind of activity sparks debate about objects that, trust me, nobody would look twice at otherwise. This project was actually inspired by one of my favorite social object projects, which happened in 2009 in a really small museum and library in England. Um, this museum decided we want to create a project that really gets people talking to each other about the artwork in our collection. So they did a project that does not sound like it would accomplish this. They created an exhibit called Top 40, Worcester's Favorite Pictures from the Collection. That's right, they hung 40 paintings on the wall. That's it. 
But then they did something else. In the middle of the room, they put a ballot box. And they invited people to vote for the painting they wanted to see go up in the top 40 countdown the next week. Every Friday night, the staff would go through all of these ballots, and they would move around these labels. You can see there's a big label here that says number nine in the countdown of favorite pictures. So every Friday night, they would count up the votes. They would move around the numbers. And the museum staff said they knew it was working when on Saturday mornings, there were people lined up outside the museum <laughs> waiting to come in and see how the numbers had changed. That there were people who would come back week after week to stand by their favorite painting and lobby strangers to vote for it. <laughs> And I got to tell you, I used to do international work, and I would talk about this stuff, and they'd say, oh, you Americans are so social. It works there. Well, it works in England, too. I've seen it happen all over the world. <laughs> and so when we do this kind of social object activation, I guess one question to think about, why do we care if people have conversations about art? What's the, ma what's the meaning of this? And for me, the reason it matters is because the conversations we have around museum objects, the conversations we have around cultural artifacts, are different than the conversations we have in other spaces. Here's one of my favorite examples from an exhibition called Race, Are We So Different, which has been traveling around science museums in North America. These teenagers are looking at a very simple, provocative museum object, two stacks of real money indicating income disparity between whites and blacks in the US. The conversation they are having about this object is not a conversation that they are having at the mall. It's not a conversation they're having on Facebook. And it's a conversation we need to be having if we're going to solve some of these problems that Liz talked about and that Chris so eloquently talked about. And you don't even need a precious object to do this. One of my favorite artists is public artist Candy Chang, who's done projects like this one in New Orleans after Katrina, where she went around town to all of these dilapidated and destroyed buildings and invited people to wish for what could happen to these buildings, turning things that were eyesores into these social objects as locuses of hope and opportunity and possibility shared together. I think we've all experienced the power of what social objects can do to bring us together with strangers, even people we might think we have nothing in common. The second thing I've learned about social objects is this. You know, Chris talked a lot about technology. It's also a big part of my work. One of the things I'm really interested in is how socializing on the web has inherent barriers in it, the kind of anonymity that we often decry when we look at things like this. Um, but those barriers also have benefits. They don't just cause us to write and name things. They also create opportunities for us to be intimate in ways we would never be in real life. And I want to start and give you a real life example to describe this. So I live down in Santa Cruz, um, just down the road from here. We have a historic boardwalk on the beach that features a wooden roller coaster, the Giant Dipper. It's amazing. Come down and visit. Um, but what I want to talk about is actually not what happens on the roller coaster, but what happens when you're in line to ride the roller coaster. OK, so when you're in line, this is very dark, but there are people behind a barrier waiting to get on the ride. And you can kind of see the front of a car coming in at the end of its ride. And then here's what happens. As a car comes in, people at the barrier stretch out their arms over the barrier. And people in the car reach up their arms. And boom, that's a high five between two strangers. OK, you could stand on the boardwalk all day like this, and nobody will give you a high five. But the barriers inherent in this roller coaster situation, both the wall and the fact that you are literally ships passing in the night, creates an opportunity for a kind of intimacy that would not make sense in other situations. And this is the kind of intimacy I see happening again and again on the web. You see it in projects like Post Secret, where people mail in postcards with secrets they've never told anybody before in the world. And they're posted on one of the most popular blogs in the world. You see it in projects like 52 to 48. Uh, this was a project that was started after the 2008 election was over when artist Zay Frank invited people to send messages across the aisle to try and bridge some of the acrimony that came out of that election. You even see it in trivial projects, like a Swedish um, teenager saying, I want a million people to send me a piece, an artwork that represents a giraffe so I can win this bet with my friend. All of the activities that people do through these, the kind of intimacy that comes from them, is possible because of the barrier of technology. And so I challenge you to think about these opportunities, both in real life and when you're dealing in digital space. Um, and this is a project I want to share with you that I did with a few students, uh, graduate students, a few years ago in Seattle. They created an exhibition about advice. The whole exhibition had lots of different ways for people to give and get advice. But this was the most successful part, an advice booth that was set up so anybody could come up and say, I want to give advice. Boom, you sit in the advice booth, and you just take all comers. <laughs> So I was in there one day, and there's a seven-year-old in the advice booth. He's sitting there. And a college student comes up, and she says, 
I'm having this problem with my boyfriend. Our relationship has gotten a little stale. What should I do? He doesn't skip a beat. He just says, you should do something you've never done before, like stay up all night and eat candy. <laughs> and that was pretty good advice. And from a design perspective, what I am so interested in is the fact that $15 worth of plywood erected a barrier that made it OK for a seven-year-old to give a college student <laughs> advice. And so I challenge you when you're thinking about how to design for community gathering, don't just think about how to bring people together. Think also about what kinds of barriers can allow people to leapfrog over some of their uncomfortabilities to have intimacy and connections they might not otherwise have. And that leads me to my last point, which is the reason that I care about all of this stuff is because I have seen again and again how social objects can bridge the gap from our individual experience to our collective experience. So many of us are passionate about bringing communities together. But doing that doesn't mean saying, let's have a big room and we'll just put a bunch of people in there and presto, community. We have to find these microtransactions of these connections between people, in my case, through objects, to be able to collectively build a community. And I want to end with just one story about this. Um, last year, we had an exhibition at the museum that was a Joan Brown exhibition related to love. And so we'd set up this space with some of her paintings and then some tables and a setup where you could make collages out of magazines uh, representing love. And so what you see here is a pretty typical museum scene. In the foreground, you have one group of people talking. And in the background, you have another group of people making collages. And never the twain shall meet, two stranger groups. So the next time I walk through this space, here's what I see. Two great social objects, the activity of making collages and the baby, have created an opportunity for these strangers to come together and to talk to each other in the space. And the next time I walk through here, and I wish I had a photograph of this, this man has handed his baby to these strangers. They are sitting down and making art with it, and he has turned back to his conversation with my colleague Stacy. I remember seeing this and thinking, my god, if the museum can be a place where you will willingly hand your baby to a stranger, then we're doing a lot to bring people together in our community. And for me, ultimately, the goal of what we do is not so much about the learning that happens in our space or even the way that people come together within the museum. It's about how it changes the way they look at other people on the street. It changes the way that you look at somebody and you don't think, oh, that's somebody I can't talk to or that's somebody who's not for me, but instead saying, hey, there's a connection here. Here's an opportunity. Let's make something happen. And so I challenge all of you as you think about how you can bring communities together, yes, think big, but also think small about those objects that can bring us together, those barriers that we can leap over to make intimate connections that transform our communities and ourselves. Thank you.